will be presented by George Bissaka on behalf of Michael Allen Miller and Dimitri uh, Galatzina. And George is presenting a paper on his way down here now called The Development of a Spring Mechanism for the Use in Conjunction with Auxiliary Supports for Previously Thinned Panels. And it will be a continuation of some of the things that we saw this morning, probably. So, George, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, I have to admit that this, is, this uh, talk is a little bit hastily cobbled together because uh, I had no time, really, from... Uh, from the return and then preparing the previous one. However, I'm sorry. Okay, that's probably better. But uh, anyhow, I wanted to uh, uh, first trace some of the early um, developments of uh, spring mechanisms uh, and their their history. Uh, just a few examples uh, in Italian conservation through the 70s and 80s. Uh, and 90s, and then uh, move on to the development of, uh, of the mechanism which you saw this morning that we applied for the first time on the uh, Durer, Adam, and Eve, uh, or on the Adam. Uh, this first example that I'm showing is actually not spring loaded, but it's a <coughs> mid 1970s on a Sassetta um, Predella panel that's in the Vatican connect, uh, collections, and uh, it's, it's one of the earliest. Uh, perimeter strainers uh, that is uh, has connected to it uh, round section rods and and the and uh, you can see these these plexi blocks that have um, embedded in them um, a threaded rod and so that uh, before attachment they can be uh, unscrewed or screwed. Uh, so that uh, it can follow the curve of a panel, and you can see that the uh, they thought anyhow that uh, it would be able to move back and forth on uh, on the rod, sliding on the on the rod. But uh, in effect, uh, it probably uh, didn't work so well, and, and and would bind would bind fairly easily. But I just showed this example because it was a short step from there to uh, a fantastic solution in uh, 1981 already, a spring-loaded mechanism for this triptych by, uh, by Cristoforo Scacco that's at Capodimonte in Naples, which uh, has a, a perimeter strainer and uh, a quite sophisticated mechanism for um, controlling wood movement. Again, you have the, the uh, aluminum rod, uh, which has uh, the plexi cylinder, uh, go through it, and you see it's 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 a little bit uh, uh, bigger dimension inside than it is, uh, or, or towards the extremities than it is in the middle, so that uh, it, it keeps it from binding. And um, you can see that uh, it has two concentric springs, where uh, this this spring regulates the the, the movement in terms of uh, warpage, and they thought that the lateral movement would be taken care of by uh, sliding on the rod, but also. Uh, the second spring, which fits back up into this uh, cavity here, that that would take care of deflection uh, in terms of uh, increase of warp or change in that warp anyhow, that it could deflect one way or another to take that into account. And that's a fairly sophisticated development for 1981 uh, because uh, after that, mechanisms used instead in Florence, uh, mostly designed by Ciro Castelli, this was, uh, uh, this was a system uh, that is, mm, at least on the exterior, that, that, that looks more like a traditional uh, cross piece and that it embeds the uh, mechanism within the cross piece. And uh, you can see by sliding back and forth, uh, it, it takes care of movement in uh, vertical uh, and also horizontal direction. We uh, at the Metropolitan later uh, modified uh, some uh, of this design by making a square section cylinder so that the, uh, uh, the adjustment of the spring tension is done by, uh, first of all, there's a slot here, by unscrewing the slot once the square section nut uh, 
uh, catches on the edge of the surface, it can be pulled in by itself by unscrewing the rod. And uh, this way you can adjust the tension stronger or weaker, and you can also uh, change, the, uh, change the springs. You can change the, the, dent, the thickness of the spring so that you can make it weaker or stronger, and then it has a certain amount of adjustability built into it. That was the system that we used on the back of the Van der Weyden in 1990. Uh, it was a system also uh, modified and, and, and developed by Dmitry Galitsin, who helped us uh, design the current mechanism that we'll, we'll present in a few minutes. This is us preparing it on the Van der Weyden, and uh, you, you, you see that we, we've uh, changed certain things about the, uh, the amount of contact between the, uh, between the Teflon. It's actually not Teflon. It's harder than Teflon. Forget what the material was now that we used, but um, uh, it uh, the components go like this, where the the rod uh, or the shoe is screwed onto the. In this case, it was screwed onto the panel because we set it into uh, uh, modern wood because we replaced the butterflies. So we 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 were not attaching it into the actual uh, original panel, but but. Um, uh, applied it in, in only the new wood, but the point was that when the mechanism is uh, fully loaded, then it, uh, it it looks very much like a like a traditional cross piece, so that aesthetically uh, it was a decent solution. The only problem with this type of solution is it separated the movements into uh, uh, perpendicular forces, so it was either up and down or uh, or, or uh, laterally, and it, and it didn't take into account this deflection aspect like the 1981 system uh, did. That was done much more successfully by Franco del Zotto, in, um, who was from uh, Udine, uh, and um, he made these uh, Teflon cups uh, uh, to, so that uh, both t at the top and the bottom, uh, the, the entire mechanism could, uh, could pivot. And uh, here's a few of those designs. One of the problems of these uh, systems was that they were really designed for uh, still relatively thick panels. I mean, if you had an Italian panel of three or four centimeters thick and it was thinned down to to two or two and a half centimeters, it still has considerable strength. And so the overall uh, depth uh, was not really such a problem. But uh, w we were interested in uh, coming up with something. Here are the component pieces. We were interested in coming up with something that would reduce the overall, uh, the overall height uh, from the back of the panel. So Franco also uh, made some alterations in that he tried to reduce the height by going to uh, a kind of leaf spring, uh, which was on the exterior of the cross piece, and these were uh, different different developments that happened through the the uh, late eighties and early nineties. But um, in order to deal with the very thin uh, thin panels, oak northern panels that that were thinned and cradled, uh, Ciro Castelli in nineteen eighty nine uh, came up with this treatment on the Henry Met de Blaise from the Uffizi, I believe, no? Naples. Uh, from Naples. That, um, that was the, f the first sort of uh, uh, spring mechanism that was a little bit finer. It was smaller in scale and could deal with maybe um, movements that uh, what, what would happen is there would be a pre-drilled hole in this little block of wood and uh, the arm of the spring would be free moving within that so that as the panel expanded and contracted it could move and uh, the convex flexing could be handled by um, the deformation of the cylinder of the spring and uh, this worked quite well and, and it led to various other, uh, other systems there. We took that uh, same idea at the Metropolitan and modified it so that we put a uh, we put a, a screw through the cylinder so that that was a fixed point, and we uh, put a pivot point in the block of wood with a slot cut in it so that uh, it, it could pivot uh, up and down much more easily, and that we could adjust the tension by um, the preload tension by pushing this arm down as far as uh, one wanted to have the tension and then screwing it into the side so that it would be something like this. Uh, uh, Chiro then later, uh, as Marco showed uh, earlier this morning, went to a conical 
uh, conical spring. I, I actually had emailed Chiro to send me some photographs of, of this, but he had already left Italy, and so I only had th these rather poor examples. But fortunately, Marco showed a similar, uh, uh, similar diagram for these uh, conical-shaped springs, which allow movement really in, in, in any uh, direction. So we were looking to uh, make uh, a similar device. So over the course of the past year, uh, Alan Miller and myself have been working together with Dimitri Galitsin of Design Development Associates to, um, m to make a device. We, we established some goals for ourselves, easy installation, easy pretensioning, easy tension changes, easy tracking of movement, economical and reusable. These were various, uh, various um, attempts, prototypes that were made, and I'll go over each one of those uh, now. The, the first attempt, we wanted to make something that was maybe um, uh, a spot with a spiral kind of spring so that it would limit the overall length of it. And uh, most importantly, we were wanting to reduce the overall depth by changing the movement from vertical to horizontal. And this we would do by, with, a, with a, a cable, which would be a steel braided cable or some kind of thing that could easily change, change direction and, uh, uh, without much friction and uh, be able to, to move in any, any direction. But of course, this one had lots of problems like the deformation of the spring. Uh, uh, as tension increased on it, it would def deform over here. So we quickly abandoned uh, this and what we did first is we went right away to a linear spring, but it worked in tension. And uh, w uh, when it was tipped up, you could screw the back side here. Uh, you could unscrew it so that it would um, it would increase the tension on the spring so that you would get uh, greater recall. And then uh, you could put it oh, and then you could put it uh, put it down and screw it in uh, to a surface. But problem here was. Uh, that it was difficult to change the, the preload tension. You had to, had to lift it up, and it was also too long. So we went back to a spiral device, and we put a, a coil extension spring around a central hub, uh, and it was something that also would be able to set um, a preload uh, tension on the, on, on the outside. And here it had a cover, and uh, here you can see pretty simply how, how that worked. And this was a prototype that, uh, that came out of that. Um, we uh, then didn't like the idea of the coil spring opening uh, less on the inside than the outside as it wrapped around the, the center hub. So instead, we moved the spring uh, over to a center, um, center column, and uh, we attached one bead chain around a, a hub and a second smaller one underneath it. Um, so this was the, the, the next step in our, in our evolution. Uh, here you see also the, the button, which is very similar to the one we ended up with, that um, just has the bead chain go into a, 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 into a slot very simply and can, uh, can be removed. Um, this is the component pieces exploded. Uh, after that, we, we changed the method of uh, setting the pretension by going to a first an eccentric hub uh, onto which the spring could attach directly, and we put a cable um, leading to the capstan so that it would be easy to, to increase the tension by turning the capstan um, underneath. Oh, here's, here's one of the prototypes of the, of the eccentric hub. And here you have the underside of the capstan. You could see by, with this little spring here, you could push down on it and turn a quarter turn, quarter turn, and keep uh, increasing the, the, the preload tension as much as desired. Uh, we later changed that to a leaf spring. It was just an easier system. The, um, the spring in the previous one was, uh, sometimes was binding, and so w that led to some problems. We were. Uh, Oh yeah, we were making this hub section out, out of Delrin, um, was cast in Delrin. Uh, from there, we went to another uh, version, which was the first one that was enclosed in a, in a total casing. And um, we tried to simplify it 
by going, we w went back to a, 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 a coil spring again, even though we knew this was gonna be the most expensive part of it because they would have to be fabricated specially, but uh, we thought that uh, it was, was worth pursuing that. It had, though, a little bit more difficult uh, setting for the uh, setting the pretension, you would have to uh, uh, lift the spring out of there and put it in the next successive hole. You can see the the cover that we made on it. You could you could tell how much pretension was there, and then you could read uh, up to a two centimeter um, movement uh, of the uncoiling of the spring. And another uh, feature that was that was very good here. Uh, sorry, was uh, we introduced this. Um, this, this little um, fin uh, onto, which uh, fit onto the uh, bead chain so that uh, after it, it, it went the two or two and a half centimeters, whatever we would, we would figure into it, it would automatically release itself so that in, in case the tension built up uh, inordinately uh, at a certain point, uh, it, it would release itself by, uh, quite naturally. So that was the, the, the next uh, device. After that, uh, we went to uh, a, another one, and this was, uh, I think, the, the one I referred to this morning as, as being um, one that we hoped to put into production, but then uh, the, 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 the cost was just, uh, just too much. And you can see that um, here we've simplified it uh, even more, uh, but uh, the pretension from the outside was uh, very easy here, just with a thumb and a forefinger, uh, that you could just unscrew slightly this uh, nut, turn the spring, and because because we had a um, we had a tooth washer at the bottom, it could it could fix that pretension quite easily, but still allowed the spring coil to uh, to unwind um, after that. So here's a few more images of of that and. Um, And then this was the prototype that we made of that. This happened to be milled out of brass. I think that was milled out of brass, and, and um, here it is with its cover on. And we really were excited about that and hoped to go into production because it was quite small. It was uh, four centimeters, I think, or, uh, or so, or five. And it, and it really worked, uh, worked quite well. It would... It would um, here you can see how, how movement would, would work as it unfolded. So um, then we, uh, when we got the bad news about the cost overrun, we went back to a linear device again because we had learned a lot of things along the way and we realized also that not only the straight line transmission of the uh, force was probably uh, a good idea and this time though instead of the uh, linear mechanism be working in tension, we had it be in compression so that uh, it pulled from the back of the spring and it would compress the spring rather than pull it in tension. And it also had a, uh, a device, very simple device for preloading tension by, by just unscrewing the screw and sliding the mechanism farther over. So um, that was quite easy, but it was still far too long. It was around, uh, I think, n nine centimeters or so long and that was going to be a problem and especially uh, narrow panels for getting enough of the devices on there. So um, we made a prototype and so on, but um, we went back uh, and found a way to reduce the overall thickness in the device that we finally ended up with, which uh, you can see here. And um, uh, in this device, uh, let's see, the exploded version, the, the reason that, uh, that this one really worked well is that, is that obviously the, the brass square section tube is readily available in any uh, metal supply shop, so it required very little uh, milling. You know, you're just, you're just uh, routing uh, two slots in it and rounding off an end on it, and uh, these pieces also are brass very simple and painted a little red red tip on here and this is the most common 
type of spring on earth. It's available anywhere in thousands of, uh, of strength. So you can get it in, in, in any length, you can get it in any stiffness, you can get it out of various kinds of materials. So that would afford you uh, a near infinite variety of, uh, of strengths. Uh, and on top of that, you had the pretensioning aspect uh, to it as well. So this came out to be a very simple solution to our problem, and the overall length is about five centimeters. Uh, additionally, because it was so narrow, it's only uh, one centimeter wide, uh, in case of very narrow panels, you could uh, put them even side by side in opposite directions so that, so that it gave you a lot of flexibility uh, for how to, how to assemble them. So um, these are just the instructions for uh, the kinds of slots that needed to be cut. All you needed to do is cut one slot in one direction and drill a hole through in another direction. So this would be a sort of shelf on which the mechanism would sit and the, uh, and the, 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 the cable would come, down, would come down through here. So uh, this is able to, uh, again, you can set differentially across the panel um, you can have it be stronger uh, in the middle, and, and each mechanism, as it goes out towards the extremity, could be uh, could be either of a, uh, a less strong spring, or, a, or or it could be, have less pretension set into it. And uh, this would move, would deflect uh, quite easily. It's about as simple as you could imagine, and, and it could also move uh, left and right in any direction. So, uh, pretty much unobstructed. An obstructed movement. So this is the the final uh, mechanism. Uh, again, you can, uh, if you remember the exploded version, this is just a cap to hold the end of the spring, and the um, the cable has has a, a a steel ball on both ends, and that's the most expensive. Uh, element in the system. It's a fixed length, and uh, the way that it's calculated is that from its um, dormant state like this, it's exactly 15 millimeters from the top edge of this down to uh, the insertion in the um, uh, in the button attached to the panel. So that means uh, if you need to maintain that, there's there's different ways you can play with the thickness. You could always uh, put a wooden block underneath the button, or additionally, you could uh, do what we did with the atom there, is that even though we went with a, a thicker uh, cross piece than we had originally anticipated, we just routed a track in there down to 15 millimeters and, uh, and set the mechanisms in like that. So it's, it has built into it enough flexibility uh, to have uh, real versatility. So by unscrewing here, you could set the pretension, whatever, uh, whatever amount that you wanted. Um, this was the, the first box of prototypes that, uh, that Dimitri made that were all actually hand, handmade that we brought to Madrid with us for the, um, for the Durer. And here's the only uh, tools that you needed. You needed these two, a Forstner bit and a router bit. There's the spring mechanism uh, that uh, can be substituted uh, inside and, and just one single wood screw. So. Uh, quite quite a simple thing, and these slides that you already saw this morning of us deciding on the number of them uh, across the strainer, you notice that uh, these these ones uh, are, are put on vertically rather than horizontally, and that the reason for that is we decided that it would be a good idea not to weaken the joints here or here by 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 putting it uh, right in the corner, and we decided to put it above there, and by putting it in the vertical. It works exactly the same in the vertical orientation or in the or in the horizontal one, and we felt that that would give us uh, much more space to be able to organize uh, uh, to, to distribute them evenly on the surface here now it's it 's debatable how many you would add them I and uh, people could have different views on that whether they 're related to uh, joint placement or symmetry across the panel is, is a debatable issue, but anyhow you can resolve it. Uh, any way that you, that you like. So these were just those few slides of uh, showing the, with the Forstner bit, and then uh, we made just a makeshift uh, device for, for cutting the slots. 
And uh, so here's the strainer from the underside, the part that would contact the panel. You just have single holes drilled through. And uh, from the other side, you see the slots. Uh, we're tracing the, tracing the circle. You, there you can see it uh, traced onto the panel. You can isolate with B72 um, if you like. And um, then this is the application. This is with the 1253 resin in this case. We used the 1253 here because the panel was curved, and if we used, say, something like the 2011 uh, resin, or if we used a thickened B72, it would tend to slide, <laughs> to slide over because of the curve of the panel. But with the paste aerodite, it just stayed put, and it also helped in areas. There were a couple of places where, um, where the button would fall in an area like this that had a concave. Um, from planing of the panel when the cradle was, when it was thin. And uh, so uh, these, the paste aerodite worked very well for those situations. I, I tended to, uh, I, I tend to like to overuse the, uh, the resin and then take a very fine uh, sort of one millimeter uh, gouge and, and carve a round section at the interface with the panel uh, along the outside because that little bit of a lip uh, does an enormous amount for the hold of the uh, of the button onto the panel. So here's uh, how simple it is to put it in. You just uh, slip the the ball into the slot there, uh, lay it down flat, put the screw in, and screw that uh, through. And then this is setting the pretension. So you just put the Allen wrench in, unscrew, slide it forward some, and then. Uh, then it's ready to go. Now in the sequence I showed this morning, I had only the panel itself, but here you'll be able to track at the same time so that you can see uh, every gradation here, one millimeter of uh, movement on the panel is one millimeter on the, on the scale so that, so that the whole thing moves together back and forth. So. Uh, this, we, we developed this with the idea of making it commercially available. We will not produce it at, at the Metropolitan, but instead uh, Dmitry Galitsyn, uh, his design company, will produce the device. And, and I'd like to ask Dmitry to stand up, if he would, in case there he is, uh, here, in case anyone is interested in talking with him further about the eventual um, commercial availability of the, uh, of, of the device. Welcome to talk to him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, George. It was good to see what it was that we saw this morning and how it really will work.